the last year of American politics has been the most divisive and partisan and, and nasty in, in living memory. People unfriending each other on Facebook and blocking each other on Twitter and wearing hats, wearing hats to display their virtues. So the Trumpies wear the red hats, make America great again. And it's not just about MAGA. I think it's about displaying particular virtues like patriotism, loyalty, respect for authority. And on the other side, the social justice warriors or lefties wear the pink pussy hats, right? Which also are virtue signals, right? Different virtues, though. Virtues like uh, feminism and care and justice and so forth. And that kind of political virtue signaling is, is well known. Typically, the phrase virtue signaling is a term of derogation typically used by the right against the left, but it, it can be inverted either way. Uh, but it's not just about politics, right? It's also about how we interact on social media. Uh, you know, d saying you're just virtue signaling is a very common insult now on Facebook and Twitter and Snapchat and so forth. And there's a general skepticism about virtue signaling as just, a, it's a bad thing and it should be minimized in society, it's sort of ethically invalid. Um, and, it's, and it's everywhere, and society is collapsing because everyone's running around showing how virtuous and ethical and moral they are in various ways. And I think that's the wrong way to think about virtue signaling. The, the, the correct objective descriptive way to think about it is we all run around showing off our virtues to others in more or less credible ways, sometimes less, like we just, you know, wear a pink pussy hat and then do nothing else for feminism the rest of the year. But particularly in the domain of business, marketing, advertising, and branding, I think it's crucial to understand how different constituencies are showing off their virtues to each other um, in all sorts of ways that typically don't get discussed clearly or consciously in business. So, consumers, we know, buy ethical brands of various sorts. That's a clear example of virtue signaling, like I, I buy organic. Companies promote their ethics through vision statements and try to align those with the, the corporation's brand identity. Shareholders themselves do, quote, ethical investments and sometimes use, you know, the ethicality of the companies as one criterion among several for deciding where to put their money. And employees generally want to work for companies that are seen as doing good things in the world. So virtue signaling is sort of pervasive in the decisions we make related to business. So how does this work for consumers, right? Well, here's a young man, and he might make a statement sort of offhandedly like, I, I buy Grounds for Change coffee. And Grounds for Change is a particular brand of coffee that is fair trade, organic, shade grown, and carbon free. So, if the women who want his attention and are evaluating him as a potential, you know, mate, um, they're, they're doing this instead of grinder, or instead of posting questions on here, um, they might respond positively to that, right, and go, I'm gonna interpret his consumer choice as indicating his ethics, his moral identity, his values. And there's a little skeptic down on the right corner who knows about game theory and signaling theory, who goes, or are you just showing off personal traits considered virtuous to gain social, sexual, and status benefits without necessarily delivering real benefits to others? In other words, is it cheap talk? Well, consumers try to signal their virtues in all kinds of ways to multiple constituencies, friends, potential mates, rivals, relatives, coworkers, and neighbors. They do this through purchasing goods and services, buying, using, displaying, discussing, and reviewing these products in all sorts of uh, media and venues. And what they're doing is, is not necessarily maximizing subjective expected utility as in the standard economic model. Often what they're doing instead is maximizing their apparent virtues, even at the cost of paying more even at the cost of the product itself being a lower quality experience, but being a better signal. And yet, most consumer behavior research 
does not consciously or systematically analyze people's virtue signaling strategies or really dig very far down into why exactly are they buying this product and what virtues is it signaling. Likewise, let's see, there we go. Companies, brands, and products signal their virtues to many constituencies, companies, workers, investors, rivals, but also suppliers, uh, retailers, government regulators, right? Keep the regulators off our backs by being virtuous appearing companies. And they do that in all sorts of ways, through the company name itself, through the company slogan like Google, don't be evil, the vision statement, their, their employment policies, uh, publicity, advertising, promotions, product design, and product features. Now, when companies do this, like Chef Boyardee selling canned pasta using the Wonder Woman feminism icon, right, it's easy to kind of satirize that and mock it, as with spoof ads like Taco Bell. What are the virtues of Taco Bell? Uh, we're open and you're stoned. <laughs> and most companies do not analyze or optimize their virtue signaling strategies or figure, figure out, you know, what ethics are we conveying? Let's, let's measure that. But you can, you can measure it. So one question arises, what personal traits, for example, by consumers or by employees, does virtue signaling really signal? Now, we're familiar with the idea of sexual ornamentation in nature, where all kinds of animals have these conspicuous displays that signal their fitness and their genetic quality to potential mates. Um, what's, what's the analog of genetic quality that's being signaled here? I've analyzed all this in four books that are mostly about trait signaling, and a lot of them are about virtue signaling, and you can read all of that, particularly the Spent book uh, from 2009. And I think a key thing to pay attention to is, well, number one, for God's sake, never talk about the Myers-Briggs personality inventory ever again, at least in my company. It's, it's something that was founded on, you know, Jungian archetypes and invented by, by two people 70 years ago, and it's been completely debunked, and it's, it's absolutely obsolete, and please don't use it. Uh, use the Big Five uh, personality trait system. The Big Five is pretty good because it identifies stable, reliable, heritable individual traits, individual differences traits that predict behavior across species. You can find the Big Five in all the other great ape species, across cultures, across situations, across life. And the Big Five are openness, conscientiousness, agreeableness, extroversion, and stability. And the key thing to note here is that all of these have a kind of ethical dimension to them. Not that one extreme is necessarily more ethical than the other extreme. People disagree about their ethics. But a trait like openness, open-mindedness, curiosity, tolerance, if you're high on openness, you tend to be liberal, politically liberal, cosmopolitan, you like multiculturalism, you're pro-immigration. If you're low on openness, that doesn't mean you know, you're stupid or, or low conscientiousness or anything else. It just means you're more traditionalist, right? You care more about your ethnic group than other groups, et cetera. If you don't know how your customers score on these big five traits, it can be quite difficult to figure out what are their ethics and what are they virtue signaling. How does this play out? Let's take a couple examples. That openness trait that I mentioned, low openness, again, conservative, in-group loyalty is a value. Uh, they like nationalism. They tend to be a little bit more pro-censorship in terms of anti-porn, but um, more free speech in terms of things like academic free speech on campus. Uh, they tend to support vanilla monogamy, boring, and they tend to be high in sexual and moral disgust. So how do you reach those people? What kinds of companies tend to make a kind of low openness pitch. Well, the Christian companies in America, right, Hobby Lobby and Chick-fil-A, the things that are boycotted by the social justice warriors, they're actually quite comfortable having a low openness identity. And they knew that if they caved to the protesters, they would lose a lot of their, their core customers who would go, you're just selling out our, our, our values. And they made the right call, I think, in resisting those, those boycott uh, demands. For some reason, Coca-Cola seems to be a lower openness brand than Pepsi. 
for weird historical contingency reasons. Uh, Mary Kay Cosmetics tends to be a low openness, more conservative, traditionalist brand. On the other hand, the high openness brands, Apple's $100 billion of brand equity is basically because Apple is an openness signal. That's mainly what it is. You're the guy in the coffee shop with the Apple computer. That means you're probably more liberal, multiculturalism-oriented, globalist, kinky, polyamorous, etc. <laughs> more fun to approach if you're Tara. Um, but sometimes these things go terribly, terribly wrong, like when Starbucks had the Race Together um, promotion, where they were trying to get people to talk about race in coffee shops with strangers. didn't work very well. Um, Benetton has been successful with a multiculturalism-themed ad campaign, but note that it will have turned off all the low openness customers. Um, and Google tends to make a lot of uh, high openness pitches. But again, that, that runs the risk of alienating traditionalists. Uh, agreeableness is another one of the big five traits. Um, a lot of you here are probably fairly high in agreeableness, and that means you'll like brands that say certified vegan or cruelty-free cosmetics that show I care about other humans and other beings and, and you know, sentience and, and love and kindness, right? The Hillary Clinton um, slogan. Um, or Subaru, which has made a wonderful, um, uh, has wonderful success appealing to, to lesbian consumers and explicitly positioning itself as a high lesbian, agreeable, nurturing, uh, feminine brand. On the other hand, a lot of other um, companies and products like Ford have been very successful in targeting the low agreeableness people who are not bad people, they're not all psychopaths, they're simply more masculine, tough-minded, um, self-oriented, protective, etc. So pitches like, um, even with makeup, L'Oreal, because you're worth it, is a fairly low agreeableness pitch compared to cruelty-free. Um, death metal, low agreeableness musical genre. Heckler and Coke, uh, no compromise, right? Semi-automatic 223 assault weapons. It's a fairly low openness product, but they know, they know that, and that's okay. So, uh, as you leave here today, think about, just a little more systematically, what are we really helping our consumers to signal to their friends, neighbors, mates, rivals, etc.? Does your brand strategy explicitly include a virtue signaling strategy? Does your marketing team, in particular, include diverse not just demographic diversity, but ideological diversity, or at least doesn't match your customer ideology and ethics. Right? Does your team include the kind of political and religious and moral attitudes that truly reflect your consumers? Most products have a kind of political and moral dimension, and if you're not aware of what it is, you're probably missing some core concerns of your customers. Do you do market segmentation by virtue signaling strategies or just by demographics and preferences? And you can analyze big data in terms of virtue clusters, not just demographics. And are your company virtues, brand virtues, and product virtues all aligned with each other and with your customers? Because cu customers will punish any inconsistencies or equivocations or vagueness about uh, a lot of these moral issues. So, uh, to wrap things up, I think we can take these, these virtue signaling instincts that run very deeply in human nature to do well and do good at the same time. Um, virtue signaling has been a taboo topic until fairly recently because it's, it's seen as sort of beneath contempt for people to use products to show off their moral values. But that's what consumers do all the time. That's what companies do all the time. So, virtue signaling runs deep in biology. Um, I'm going to get the music in a minute. Come on, music. Okay. One more minute. Uh, we can ignore it or fight it. You know, tell customers you shouldn't virtue signal. Right? You should just maximize expected subjective utility. Um, or we can use it to actually you know, make more money and deliver more value to consumers in the form of products that they can use to signal their virtues to the people they want to signal their virtues to. And the better we understand virtue signaling, the better we can design, market, and build communities.
communities around our products, truly ethical communities, right, that punish cheap talk and that actually reward genuine altruism. So the ideal situation would be, you know, in five or ten years, we'd have customers, not just political analysts, tuned into virtue signaling. And customers might actually say things like, hi, person I met on Grindr, um, or Tinder, if she's not gay, sorry. Um, <laughs> I harness my virtue signaling instincts to make consumer purchases that maximize my subjective well-being while minimizing avoidable suffering for all sentient beings on the planet. And then, hopefully, the response would be, let's make babies. I'll end there, and we've got time for questions, I hope. I think one of the things you've remarked elsewhere is that one of the issues you have is that people in advertising and marketing uh, tend to be extremely high in openness. Uh, with respect to the rest of the population. Is that a fair...? Yeah, I've done some trainings with, with market researchers in which I actually administer the Big Five personality trait scales to them, and they all score extremely high on openness, and they're all politically liberal, and they don't represent the, the, the Big Five traits or the values of their customers. I think, I think there's another thing which interests me, which is that, I mean, for instance, I, I remember you on Facebook, a, a Super Bowl ad came out for Coke, which had America the Beautiful being sung by a whole mixture of ethnic groups. I don't think most people would bother by that, but in their own languages. Mm -hmm. And you said Madison Avenue has lost the plot. And sure enough, the response to that was practically insane because people said, look, you know, I don't, I don't mind this, but sing in English. If you're going to come to America, you sing in English. Yeah. And so that business, there is a danger, I think, with virtue signaling. It's not so much that it's bad in itself, but it leads to a kind of Fisherian runaway where if everybody around you signals virtue quite a lot, in order to signal it, you have to adopt an even more extreme position than the group. And therefore, it leads to a complete sort of polarization. Yeah, and this can be terrible, because if you're in a marketing group and everybody's sort of liberal, Right? But you push each other in this runaway liberalization process. Like, I'm even more multicultural, or I'm even more anti-May you know, May than you are, more anti-Brexit. You can get even farther and farther away from your customer base. And if you don't include people in your team who can challenge that, it, it can be absolutely ruinous for your relationship to your customers. And you can make terrible terrible errors in terms of, you know, creating whole ad campaigns that you think are obviously great, like obviously celebrating multiculturalism is wonderful. But there are a lot of people out there who loathe multiculturalism, and you're going to alienate them all. Maybe you want to do that, maybe you don't, but if you're not aware of that, it, it, it can be catastrophic. A very good question, actually, from Brian Miller here. Do opposites ever attract? E.g., I am low conscientiousness, but I don't want a bank or airline that is. I mean, I know we had a nice discussion with Unilever once, which is that actually the brands like Simple tend to be bought by high intelligence people, and the brands that signal high levels of scientific complexity weirdly tend to be bought by the opposite. That actually what you're doing is, is actually, counter, in a sense, uh, compensating for your own weakness. Yeah. So, of course, you all want the company you buy products from itself to actually be high conscientiousness and high agreeableness and highly open to innovation as a company. But the products you buy from them, you don't necessarily want their ad campaign to, to associate the product with, let's say, high conscientiousness because the opposite of high conscientiousness is low conscientiousness, but that also means impulsive and youthful and fun-loving and, and playful, right? And a lot of products benefit from being advertised that way. For example, anything where you want to make an appeal to kids or teens or, or the youth market. So you've got to separate the, the sort of personality attributes of the company from those we want associated with the product. And then the big five, I think it's fair to say that um, Cambridge Analytica, who work with Trump, their targeting, which is something that started in Cambridge, their whole way, form of segmentation is based on the big five. That's right. 
And so they'll essentially, uh, you know, th those are the five dimensions they see as being kind of orthogonal yeah. and universal. Yeah, a lot of market research companies are, are using the big five. And, the, you know, the advantage of that is you've got 30 years of serious psychological research with thousands of papers studying, you know, the heritability and stability and, and predictive power of those traits. If you invent your own personality system as a company, that's fine, but it'll take 30 years to get to the point that the big five is at today. A lovely question. Have you any examples of counter-virtue signaling as a backlash? And I can think of a fantastic thing if you go on YouTube and look for uh, Rolling Coal. Has anybody heard of this? You basically pimp up your Ford F-350 pickup truck, and if there's a Prius behind you, you flick a switch <laughs> on the dashboard, which causes the vehicle to produce huge amounts of black smoke. Um, so, so, I mean, it's fair to say that, I mean, quite a lot of Trump, mm -hmm. quite a lot of Trump behavior, and indeed some of his failings probably appealed as counter-virtue signaling, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. If, if, if you see one group of people who are virtue signaling and taking themselves terribly, terribly seriously, and think that they're, you know, the virtues being signaled are beyond dispute, it's very easy for a sort of counter virtue or counter dominant strategy to come in and, and to create an ad campaign that appeals to the people who think that group is so unbearably puritanical and self-righteous that this is the fun, you know, um, rebellious brand that, that, that doesn't take itself so seriously. So, lovely example of the States. I, I quite like right-wing bumper stickers as a riposte. So one thing, if you're a Brit, the idea of putting a sticker on your car saying how well your child is doing at school is complete anathema. We just wouldn't do that. But in the US, you say, my child is an honors student at so-and-so, so-and-so. I always thought it was a bit of a smug thing to do. Yeah. And I've been driving around seeing a load of these stickers, and finally I saw a pickup truck which just said, my Marine can pick off your honors student at 250 yards, which I thought was quite a, quite a good response. But so, um, the, I mean, the only thing, would you like to comment just one final thing on the effect this is having in American universities, where essentially, because they're so one-sided, yeah. That you, you've had a kind of situation, I know with Nicholas Christakis, for example, yeah. at Yale, which is just bonkers. Yeah. I'm quite involved in the academic free speech movement, and American universities are a good case of uh, kind of runaway virtue signaling by the left, largely, because 90% of academic professors are on the left politically. And the problem with that is you're, you're sort of breeding a whole generation of, of millennials and now Gen Z kids who, who emerge from college thinking this particular set of values and virtue signals is normal, and then they go interview with sort of more traditional companies who think they're batshit crazy, right? And, and they don't, they're not well calibrated to like the rest of the world, and God forbid they go into market research or advertising and think that their values are, are representative of, let's say, the American public or, or the British public. Well, the time's up, I think. Just two little things. Uh, I don't know if we've got copies of Spent and The Mating Mind, but we have both of them. Can't recommend two books more highly. Probably the most influential books I've read in my entire working life. So, Jeffrey, it's an honor. Thank, Thank you, you very much indeed.